Welcome to Discovering. Don't mind the sunglasses, it's incredibly bright out here. And it's hard to believe it's syrup season already. Throughout the Upper Peninsula, there are all types of sugar bushes. Large, small, old-fashioned, newfangled, and somewhere in between. And they all produce the same thing. Pure Upper Peninsula maple syrup. Tonight, we talk about tree tapping and some good techniques to use and some new tools to help keep your trees healthy. We want to make sure that we're tapping at a little bit of an uphill uh, angle. And the reason for that is we want that tap hole to drain properly. So sit back and relax. It's Monday night and it's time for Upper Michigan's very own Discovering. The secret streams that flow beneath the cliffs of colored stone. Forests thick and healthy with birch and pine and oak. Surrounded by the greatest lakes this world has ever known. The black bear's awesome presence as he roams the hills and fields. The call of the timber wolf, the loon's lonesome trill. The eagle soaring high above, the trout lies deep and still. These are what I treasure. The only way I measure feelings that I have for this fine land. There is so much to discover when you're a long time lover of northern Michigan. In late February, while the northern stretches of the UP were buried under a thick blanket of snow, the banana belt of the southwest UP had only a couple crunchy inches of the white stuff and bare ground. And mild temperatures meant it's time to start tapping trees. This syrup season, we're visiting the Cass Sugar Bush, run by David Cass and his family. My dad started tapping trees here about 75 years ago. The first record that we have of him actually boiling syrup is a census report from April 1950. According to the report, dad uh, was uh, 24 years old at the time. He was a maple syrup maker and he was working 85 hours a week. It didn't take long for dad to decide that he probably couldn't raise a family making maple syrup and so he got a job uh, driving truck and Maple syrup making has been a, a family tradition that we've enjoyed then ever since. When dad bought the first evaporator, he needed a place to put it, and I guess this old shed was available, so that's where it spent many years. Um, as you can see, there's not a lot of headroom in here. No plumbing, no electricity, and not a lot of shelter from the elements. But over the years, we had a lot of fun making syrup uh, in the old shed with dad. These are all buckets and bags at one time, and we used to collect sap uh, with a, a crawler tractor and a dray and pour the sap into the uh, holding tank, and then we would bring it up here, and we had a tank on the outside, and we would take the sap buckets and we'd lift them up, um, you know, 10 or 12-year-old kids lifting uh, five-gallon pails and dump them into the uh, tank, and then the tank would drain into the evaporator on the inside. So uh, I think it was good for us. I don't know. <laughs> Eventually, Dad passed on, and uh, my brothers and I got tired of banging our heads off the ceiling in there, so we decided it was time to move the evaporator from the shed uh, up to the back porch of the camp. That was a big improvement. We actually had wooden floors. We had electricity, running water, and uh, some shelter. So this is kind of the way the camp was built, um, you know, originally, and it's uh, it's been here since 1936 or 38, and we're trying to trying to preserve it and fix it up a little bit, but you can see the, the footing from where the evaporator was. It worked, it was, uh, you know, better than the, the shed, but it was scary <laughs> when you had that much fire and, and basically a little tinder box. So we made do with that for probably 25 years or so. And then my wife and I decided if we were going to uh, continue the family tradition, we needed to build uh, a new sugar house. So we did. And once again, uh, we moved the old evaporator from the back porch of the camp to the new sugar house. And we made some other improvements then too. We added a reverse osmosis machine that greatly decreases the amount of time that we have to spend boiling. We bought a pressure filter so we can improve the clarity of the syrup that we're making. 
and then we bought a small vacuum pump so that we can improve the efficiency of the sap collection. At that point, the only thing we didn't have was a new evaporator. So a couple years ago, uh, we bought a new evaporator and replaced the 70-year-old uh, evaporator that my dad bought originally. So what you're seeing here is the evolution of our maple syrup process from the old sap shed to the back porch of the camp and then uh, ultimately to the new sugar house. And it only took 75 years to accomplish. Generally, we're tapping trees the first week of March, and then we're hoping that it'll warm up, you know, usually the second week of March or so. But the last couple of years, we've seen gradual warming trends, and we figured this year we're going to try to take advantage of, of that and, and tap a little bit earlier. So we'll see how that works out. And we're going to probably tap somewhere around 350 trees this year with the hopes of making about 100 gallons of syrup. It takes about 40 gallons of sap to make one gallon of syrup, and uh, each one of these maple trees is capable of producing about five to, to 25 gallons of sap, actually. D uh, depends on how big the tree is, how healthy it is, and uh, where it's growing. Some of these trees that are growing out here in the kind of the orchard area um, get a lot more sunlight, and so they can produce a lot more sap for syrup. And a lot of these trees, um, you know, that you see here have been tapped, you know, pretty much continuously every year for, the, for 70, 75 years. Some of them have had two tap holes in it. Maple trees can live to be about 400 years old if they're well taken care of. You have to be really careful about how you tap them and practice good tapping techniques so that we keep our trees healthy and so that they you know, can live and continue to do what they're supposed to do. It's really important that we take good care of the trees. And so one of the things I wanted to show today is some of the improvements that we have in tapping techniques and what can go wrong if you don't tap properly because we have some examples of that too. These are examples of trees that we cut down earlier this year. These trees have both died and uh, some, of it, some of it might be our fault for the way we tapped them years ago. And so I just wanted to show you a little bit about what happens to a maple tree when you drill a hole in it. This white wood is sap wood and so that's what conducts the flow of sap. When you drill a hole uh, in a maple tree, you get this rectangular looking area. Uh, this is called partition wood, and that's actually a scar uh, where the tree heals that tap hole up. That wood does not conduct sap anymore, and it's also a source where microorganisms can get in, and, and yeast and fungus, and, and that can infect the tree. The rule of thumb when you tap a maple tree is it should be at least 10 inches you know, at chest level. Uh, in order to be healthy enough and, and withstand the stress of tapping. And if you look at this tree here, it's only nine inches now, and you can kind of get an idea that when it was tapped, it was probably only seven inches. It probably wasn't big enough at the time, and that may be one of the reasons that it died. And this is probably the culprit right here, because that's how we used to drill holes in trees at one time before we had uh, cordless drills. Two inches deep. Uh, and again, that's the sap wood, nice and white. If we were to drill a hole into an area of the tree that uh, has been tapped recently and we hit partition wood, that, those shavings are gonna come out brown and, and you're not gonna get any sap. That's just basically a, a scar in the tree. The other thing you'll notice though, is that this tree uh, did survive after it was tapped several times. And as a tree grows, it produces new sapwood, which grows over that tap hole. And so you can see that there's about an inch of sapwood that's, that's grown past that tap area. And that, that's important because when you tap trees, and if you do it correctly, um, you should use a pattern. So if you start on, uh, say, this side of the tree, then the next year, uh, you want to tap here and then the next year there and there and you want work your way gradually around the tree and then by the time you get back to the tap that you originally started hopefully you'll have some normal sap wood that's growing over there and if you do happen to tap into that area and you'll still get some sap flow i think both of them were probably too small when they were tapped and that might be one of the reasons uh that they died and probably one of my brothers did that We've learned a lot as we've gone through this process, and so we need firewood too. And so this is an example of you know one of our average maple trees. Um, we're using a tubing system here to collect the sap, and you can see we're kind of going uphill, and that's the end of the tubing line there, and it goes back down uh, in that direction to the main line, and so it'll all drain by gravity. First thing you you want to look for when you tap a tree is where where it was tapped last year, and you can see there's a tap hole right here. 
and that that tree uh, will will heal that tap hole by partitioning that wood off and so if we were to drill a hole in that same area we wouldn't get any sap out of it because there's there's no uh, sap being conducted in there the partition would actually extends above and below so uh, if you know if we drilled below it it isn't going to be any better than drilling right near the tap hole so we want to work our way around the tree so that we're avoiding any areas that haven't healed over and new sapwood hasn't had a chance to, to grow in there. So. Like everything else, new innovations are improving how to collect sap efficiently and minimizing damage to the trees. David shows us some of the new tools out there. These were the original spouts that we used for uh, hanging buckets on. You can see it has a little hook there and Obviously you drill a hole and it goes into the tree and these work really well. A lot of people still use them. You have to hang a bucket on these and you know if you don't have a cover on the bucket it gets full of water or you know bugs or whatever. The problem with using these, um, this is the size drill bit. This is a 7 16 inch drill bit and that's the size bit you need to get a good seal on there. This is a, a similar spout and it uses a 7 16 inch drill bit but it's designed for these sap sacks where um, the sap sack just hangs on it like that and then the bag and that's an improvement over a bucket because this keeps water and rainwater and things like that out of there but you still need to you know for this system you still need to use that size bit they do make smaller spouts now that you can use on sap sacks which these are 5 16 inch bits so you can see the um, bit size is considerably smaller this bit is used for the new spouts that we use and somewhere along the line somebody discovered that 5 16 inch hole would produce just as much sap as a 7 16 inch hole so there's really no benefit to using the bigger spouts anymore uh, and they actually are, are more harmful to the tree so you can see there's a, a lot smaller diameter this is an actual tapping bit it's designed for maple trees and you can come you can use a regular you know hardware bit but you can see there's a difference in the the style of the bit these bits are you know 12 13 dollars a piece but they're worth the extra expense because they uh, drill a much cleaner hole and the tree doesn't leave any any shavings behind and then that cleaner hole uh, tap hole actually heals better and it actually stays open a little bit longer um, too so that you're getting you know better for the tree and you're getting more sap and you get a better seal too once you pound the um, spout in there these are examples of some of the spouts that we use um, this is what they call a uh, health spout and so it comes in two parts this is the uh, tubing that would attach to our lateral lines and then in, uh, drain into the main line and we'll, we'll show you that later uh, and this is the actual spout that goes with it so these are designed uh, so that you leave these uh, in the woods every year and you don't have to replace this part you simply replace the spout so you drill a hole in the tree and then that fits on there nice and tight and just push that on by hand and then when you're done tapping for the year you just disconnect it and pull that out and then you know you're ready to go next year the the problem with that is the um, these get obviously the bacteria and things like that grow in there even when you flush them out it's impossible to get them completely clean and as a tree cools off it actually sucks some of that sap back into it and so uh, when you're using these things that that you know have been used the previous year uh, the tap hole gets contaminated much quicker and actually your your sap uh, production drops off during the season and you don't get as much sap we're trying something new this year we're actually removing the drop lines and then we're replacing them with a you know a new sterile spout that's attached to the drop line and then we're attaching that to the uh, lateral line and so the idea here is that this is sterile and so even if some of the sap that you know is collected in there at the end of the day gets sucked back in less likely to contaminate that tap hole and so you're going to get uh, better sap production as the season goes on it comes from the company and they you know that's the term they use that it hasn't been it's never had any biological substances in there so there's really not a you know i'm sure if you cultured it there probably would be something growing in there but it doesn't have the yeast and the bacteria that uh, occur you know after a season of uh, of use in the woods they actually make a, a spout with a little check valve in it so it looks exactly the same as this spout but this one you can see there's a little black check valve uh, so that when the pressure 
decreases inside the tree, that little check valve pulls back in so it can't suck any of that sap into the tree. And it's another innovation that they came up with to try to prevent contamination of the tap hole and you know prolong the, the season and, and protect the tree. see any tap holes uh, anywhere on this side of the tree. We want to make sure, you know, height wise, we want to make sure it's at least uh, above where our, our collection line is. We want to make sure that we're tapping at a little bit of an uphill uh, angle. And the reason for that is we want that tap hole to drain properly. Um, that helps uh, prevent contamination of the tap hole and it improves the, the efficiency of actually getting the sap. We don't want to go any more than two inches. And as you can see, I have a, a little black mark on my um, drill bit so they don't go any deeper than that. And then you want to hold the, the drill bit uh, firmly so that it's not wiggling around otherwise your hole is going to be oblong and it won't seal properly. So we'll get a we'll get a nice uh, firm grasp on it. And we'll and drill in exactly two inches. Oh, you can actually hear there's a little vacuum in there. So we're just getting started here now and you know and Maybe a little later in the day it'll actually start running better, but we'll, we'll go ahead and seat that in there. You want to tap it nice and firmly, but you don't want to go too hard and you can feel it stop. And it kind of makes a little different sound. Uh, and then kind of wiggle it just to make sure it doesn't move. If you drive it in too hard, you're going to crack the bark above and below the spout and then sap will leak out and you won't get a good fit on there. So you can see a little moisture starting to collect in there and that one's done. One down and 349 to go. You can see as we get farther from the um, main line, we're, we're going higher because, we, again, we want everything to go by gravity. Um, you know, it doesn't matter if you're tapping it here or here or even up there. It, um, in order for sap to get from the roots to the top of the tree, that pressure has to, to um, you know, build up. And Yeah, we got some sap here now. Again, we'll seat that. You can kind of hear it stop. If you watch that for like 15, 20 minutes, we might get three drops of sap. Forecast now for the next 10 days is pretty cold. So I think we're, we're going to see minimum um, sap uh, production, but um, you know, we'll get these trees tapped. There's some concern if you tap too early, is that tap hole going to heal over and are you going to lose out on, you know, some sap yield later in the season? You know, they've done studies on that too, to determine, um, you know, how, how soon can you tap and still expect to collect sap later in the season. And uh, some of the university settings where they, they study maple syrup in Vermont and, and uh, New York, um, they've actually found that they can tap trees in you know, January and, and even in February if they do it with very strict uh, sterile techniques and they apply vacuum to the tubings to keep the sap holes from getting contamination. Um, and so they're tapping trees earlier and earlier. And, you know, and they continue to collect sap for two or three months afterwards. That'd be too long of a season for me. So we're going to do it in February and hopefully finish the end of March. So this has that, has an old um, spout from last year. So I'm going to basically just drill a hole and then we'll put that on there. So the trees tend to warm up quicker where the sun hits them. And so it's tempting to always tap them on the south side because you're going to see sap flow a little bit earlier than you would on the north side. Um, but it's healthier for the tree to work your way around. And again, I think, I think we got good sap wood. We had nice white um, shavings coming out of there. And it is starting to drip. If we were to drill this same tree on the north side, it probably wouldn't be running just yet, but as the, as the tree warms up, you're going to get just as much flow from the north side. So we'll tap this in. We're using a little different um, tap here, but... We'll see if we get any sap dripping out of there. We're going to tap this one on the sunny side and we're going to see if there's any sap flowing. We're having a hard time today because it's a little bit cold and we're just not getting a lot of uh, sap flowing yet, but we'll see what happens with this one here. So... Ah, yes, I think this one's going to cooperate. Yeah, so this one's actually running pretty good. We'll put the spout on there. We got a good vacuum in there. Tap that in and you can see there's actually some sap flowing. You can actually see the sap, you know, it's already collecting down there, starting to flow um, 
to our lateral line and it's uh, slowly making its way. We'll enter into the um, main line and, and from there into the tank. We'll check out more of the operation and see inside the new sugar house when we visit the Cass Sugar Bush again later in the season when all the family gets together to process the sap into syrup. That's all for tonight, and I hope to see you right back here next week for Upper Michigan's very own Discovering.